Hello, I'm Toycan, and welcome back to another second channel geography video. This is a series where I talk about geography and the world and stuff. And today I wanted to talk about Russia, which is of course not the many different things, but today we're not talking about those things. We're talking about its geopolitical position and particularly I wanted to talk about Russia and its border disputes. So get ready for a controversial one and a wild comment section. But no, I really wanted to talk about Russia and I guess its position in the world because you might think if you look at Russia and insert current Russian leadership that clearly it's some form of like dictatorship and you know, like, people must hate what's going on there because you must hate what's going on there. But the truth is, from a Russian position, Russia is actually doing very well for itself because Russia historically has two huge advantages, the first of which being people. Russia has so many people living there. It's only 140 million these days, which is, you know, peanuts compared to China. It's like one-eighth of the size. Um, but it, of course, is larger than any other European country by a lot. And if you take the 20 smallest EU members, you get roughly the population of Russia. So when you have a country that is that large compared to its neighbor, in terms of population, that's a pretty big advantage, but it's also large in terms of area. So Russia is the world's largest country, even still to this day. Russia lost 25% of its uh, you know, land area uh, with the breakup of the USSR just 30 years ago. And despite losing 25% of its land area, it's still the largest country on earth by a wide margin too. You really have to zoom out and see it on a globe to really understand the size of Russia. Like, you know, a flat map barely even does it justice. Russia is a huge country with just an overwhelming mass of territory. And although a lot of that is unusable. We'll kind of come back to why that's a good thing and going to be useful later. But today, let's talk about why uh, the current leadership in Russia is so popular. You might think Russia's doing really bad from your outside perspective, that like, yeah, everything's going terribly there. Why would they keep on, you know, voting for insert person here that's doing that? But the truth is, it's a bit more complex than that. And let's explain why. So there's two primary things in a democracy, at least in the current uh, age, that get people uh, elected. The first of which is, of course, the economy. You know, the famous, it's the economy stupid slogan. Well, uh, the Russian economy uh, obviously dipped a whole bunch with the fall of communism. Uh, as you can see in 1990, uh, the economy started to dip. And this isn't, this is mostly because like, obviously, if you reorganize your entire economic system, it's going to be a huge, uh, you know, collapse. Even if, uh, you know, like capitalism was better in the end for Russia, or, you know, you can debate that. And I'm sure there's going to be some communists trying to do that exact same thing. But in the end, uh, you know, uh, re reverting from communism to a different system, especially the way Russia did it, because how, else, you know, how would you do it? You know, there's not any great system system for trying, uh, you know, it's not really been done before. Basically, Russia lost a lot of GDP in the years 1990 to 98, and then after that, things started to go up, which coincidentally, or maybe not coincidentally, if you want to believe it that way, uh, is actually when Putin has been in some form of power, whether president or prime minister or whatever, uh, Putin's been in power since then to see the national income uh, as well as the GDP. I mean, that's a little bit more skewed because Russia and oil and stuff, but still, the national income has gone hugely up since, uh, you know, the uh, late 90s, which again, roughly corresponds with uh, the current leadership and power. Again, we're just going to talk about Putin. Um, but the second thing that's going very well for Russians on, from a Russian perspective is their territorial disputes. Every So territorial disputes, they're something we love on this channel. The idea that like borders are something that like two countries can disagree on. And although Russia is famous for the Crimea example, and that's going to come up and it's going to be terrible and everyone's going to hate, like, oh, get angry at each other. But no, uh, the thing is, Russia has a lot of territorial disputes. And in every territorial dispute where two countries disagree, such as with Russia and Ukraine, there's generally, you know, each side has their own opinion. And then there's a de facto standard where things are right now. And in, in the case, uh, so if we take an example, if the UK suddenly claimed to own part of Iran or just Iran, they're going to be like, oh, yeah, that's the fifth country in the UK. The UK own, owns Iran because, you you know, they ate crumpets there once in Tehran and therefore it's ours. Even if we claim the country and every other country on earth uh, recognized it as our claim, it doesn't stop the fact that, you know, the Iranian government actually has control. The people there are still under the Iranian government. And it's the same kind of thing with every territorial dispute. Or put it in an actual example, uh, Spain and Portugal disagree over the small border town of Olivenza. This is officially in Portuguese terms, belong to Portugal, but in, 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 in every practical sense of the word, it's a Spanish village and they don't really fight about it too much because it's a Spanish village, even if they disagree over who owns it. So my point is, is that on every one of these disagreements with very minor exceptions, Russia comes up on top. They have the de facto control of their area, which means that, you know, like despite losing all of that land with the collapse of the USSR, they are doing very well since then. So the biggest example, the most controversial example is Ukraine. And although we're not going to talk about the legitimacy of it or not, because again, I, I, I feel like... E e 
this is even to take it this by itself it is a gray area it might be a very dark gray area but it is technically speaking a gray area because of the history of crimea being you know like first ottoman then russian and then only being transferred to ukraine while it was a part of the same country as russia um it is a dark gray like i said it's mostly uh, like uh yeah they annexed some territory but regardless of how they got it they own this territory crimea is in russian hands and it's very unlikely to revert even though uh it's a terrible thing for the west to agree with and uh, for the world to agree with, really i'm just saying the West because everyone puts things down to the West versus Russia. Although it is a terrible thing to have as a precedent out there, it has happened now. Russia has taken Crimea and I, I don't know what the, the solution to put it back is, but either way, Russia has won their thing. They took a huge military base, a huge island with millions of people. Their population had a huge increase. Their GDP had a huge increase because they just annexed territory that year. And that's just one example. You might think that's the only example of a territorial dispute with Russia and another country. Um, but the truth is, is they do, again, every single one of their neighbors they use this border pressure to kind of push other forms of pressure and uh, and also maybe expand in the future another example comes in georgia so i was going to do a whole video on the border georgia's uh, georgia borders and uh it's interesting because uh you know georgia is one of those countries that is slowly been going more to the west and you know that's where ukraine kind of ended up before the annexation of crimea and uh you know you might have known about the russian georgia will because russia is not a fan of that and in fact the two breakaway regions off uh, Georgia, which are officially Georgia, but are kind of in this gray area of like being half recognized, half not. They're independent countries that aren't recognized by really anyone. Uh, basically, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, in case you're curious, they're in really odd positions because they're mostly pro-Russian, you know, things. They want to merge with Russia eventually. And although, you know, again, that could happen at any point, it's going to be a whole thing. It's interesting to look into how Russia plays this situation because Russia is very supportive of both countries. They allow Russians to enter and other people to get out of it. And one of the craziest things is borderization is happening in Georgia, where the Russian, you know, this is officially a Georgian Republic within Georgia, uh, but the borders for that are slowly moving forward every now and then. They just, it's called borderization where they just move their borders a little bit. So like, oh, the borders were always here. They, they move a few hundred meters every now and then and just say, oh, what, what do you mean the borders weren't always there? That's where the border is. That's, this is Russia. <laughs> it's, it's the craziest thing, but it's really happening. This is a, this was 2017, it happened in 2013 as well. It's a, it's a really wild thing that Russia is moving their borders slowly into Georgia, but it's happening. There is this slow creep and it's not just Russia and Georgia. If you look at Transnistria, which is a part of Moldova, which is a long story with the whole Moldova thing, we've gone over it in other videos. So to be brief, uh, Moldova is a part of Romania, which was kind of forcibly broken away. And a part of Moldova has been forcibly broken away after its independence. It looks like this, if you want to be curious. It's not a real country, so it's hard to properly highlight. But this is Transnistria. And Transnistria is, again, like, it's kind of like the funny, like, independent from an independent of an independent thing. It's... It's wild, but basically uh, it's a breakaway state again with Moldova to kind of push Moldova in a more pro-Russia uh, position. And uh, yeah, they're just basically strongly pro-Russian east of the uh, the, the river here. Uh, it's called the Dnister River. I'm terrible at pronunciation. But, you know, they speak Russian there and it's this wild situation where there's some territory over here that has allegiance to Russia and they have this all over the place. And in fact, like I said, Russia wins every territorial dispute they seem to have. Uh, Russia and Latvia, they disagreed over some land. Who, who do you think won that one? Uh, Russia and Estonia, they disagree with some land that clearly made sense to be Estonian. Again, uh, so if you're not familiar, one of the craziest border anomalies in the world is, uh, it's called the Satske boot. It's the boot but, uh, just around here, where basically to drive from Lutpa to uh, the villages of here, if you want to drive through only Estonian territory, you have to drive a huge detour around, or you can take this road right here, which is part of the Estonian road network. But because of the way the Estonian-Russian borders were drawn, it means this little bit of the road goes into Russia. And although the two countries have been working out agreements to have that eventually go back, Russia's just you know, kept the territory for now. And even though it's an Estonian road that connects two Estonian villages, has no use to Russia or anything like that, it's been kept by Russia. They win all their border disputes, even the ones that are ridiculously not on their side. And I think the best example of this, uh, and I guess we're gonna get into the crazy ones later, uh, but it comes when you talk about about Japan and China. So, like I said earlier, or maybe I didn't say earlier, but <laughs> Russia borders 14 different countries, uh, the most in the world, and it is very close in proximity to a few others. And of those countries, the two most powerful really are Japan and China. So, Russia and Japan have a disagreement over the Kuril Islands. These islands right here, the bottom four, Japan claims to be theirs, whereas Russia claims them to be their own. And Russia is, the, like I said, like there's the two sides, and then Russia is the one actually administering the islands. And, um, 
Although this example has a little bit of a US involvement to it because they agreed to split the islands, but the US said that they wouldn't allow that. And there's a whole fun backstory to this dispute that I'd love to talk about sometime because I want to do a Japan video at some point. Um, but the interesting thing about these islands is that they're administered by Russia. And yeah, again, Russia, even against Japan, a arguably more powerful military economic power, uh, still keeps control of the islands. And the, but the, then the biggest example comes with China. So China is the world's second biggest player in most fields. When you think about it, I mean, they're the biggest in population, but everything else, it's like, you know, second to either, you know, EU and US or just the US uh, alone. And uh, interesting enough, this means that when it comes to Russia and, uh, you know, China, it should be lopsided in favor of China, right? Like China has all the influence and then Russia's kind of their second. However, despite this, uh, the the crazy thing to me is the fact that there was a huge dispute over this island right here. Uh, both sides call it something different and it's controversial to refer to it to either of its names because that's a ridiculous uh, you know, place we live in. But the island right here was actually uh, at one point owned entirely by Russia and uh, you know, China claimed the entirety of the thing to itself and they sorted out the agreement by Russia giving up a small percentage of the island to make the Chinese border have a straight thing like this. But it means that when the two sides had a disagreement, not only did Russia administer it in the meantime, but in the agreement they made together, you know, China only got a tiny bit of the you know combined island that you know by treaties or whatever they had a rightful claim to. That is the intensity of Russia's claim. So anyway, the, the, this is the only thing that they've already come close to losing a lot of territory with. Russia is the master of like territorial anomalies. That is why they play the game with uh, you know Ukraine and you know technically speaking Crimea on a technical level, on international standards, this isn't true. Crimea became an independent republic, which, you know, they're like, oh, that's okay by international standards. We've all agreed now with uh, Kosovo or whatever, right? You know, you're allowed to just go independent one day. And then the independent state decided to merge with Russia. That's kind of what's happening with South Ossetia and, uh, sorry, South Ossetia and Abskazia over here. Uh, <laughs> hard, hard to pronounce words, I'm sorry if I'm, I'm getting wrong. But, you know, both these countries, or both these countries are, uh, you know, doing the similar thing. They've just said independence is their thing. And long story short, having, uh, you know, playing this game of like, oh, this has happened there, so we can do it there, is what Russia is a master at. And this is why I guess the future of Russia is both good for Russians, but then also a little bit scary for the rest of the world. So again, I wouldn't actually say it's uh, hugely scary. Russia has gone from being the world's second largest power to being a regional power, effectively. Uh, whereas before it was Russia, you know, sorry, USA number one, Russia number two, or whatever. Now it's more like, you know, you've got you know, to put it simply, you've got uh, the US, you've got China, you've got the EU, and then, you know, you've got a bunch of powers below that. Um, and without, you know, being offensive to the Russian economy, it's literally smaller than California. It's smaller than Texas by itself. It's not a big country when it comes to military uh, or when it comes to economy or anything like that, but it is going to be a big country in the future. And the reason for that, it's not just like, ah, oil, it's going to keep on being pumped out there. It's the fact that they're using all of these previous techniques in the Arctic. So Russia and their Arctic plans is one of the biggest, uh, I guess, future plans for Russia. So again, keep in mind, Russia is huge, but most of Russia's land is in the far north and entirely uninhabited. There's some really weird uh, you know, phenomena, uh, such as the village where the temperature has the most variance on Earth. Uh, the literal degrees Celsius, but you know, not, we're not using like, you know, pretend degrees. Uh, degrees Celsius temperature can vary around 100 degrees from summer to winter. That happens in Russia. There's a lot of the crazy, just like edge case scenarios of how humans even live here in the Russian you know, north. Uh, and if you look at the Arctic Circle, you can see just how much of Russia actually is in the Arctic. And also you can see just how much the Arctic is in Russia, conversely, because, you know, Canada has quite a lot and the US has a little bit and Norway has some stuff, but it's mostly Russian. However, Russia is doing very good at pushing their boundaries of what is really theirs in the Arctic. They're doing it all, again, legally, uh, which is you know fine and therefore is a good thing, but they're pushing the edges by what counts as their continental shelf, for instance. But the craziest thing to me comes with the island of, of the islands of Svalbard. So Svalbard is one of the world's weirdest territories. It belongs to Norway, if you don't know, in a weird semi-ish state. So again, Norway is right here. Norway is a good country. There's Norway, I'm gonna let you disagree with that one. <laughs> I'm going to make a Norway pun every time I talk about Norway. It's terrible. But yeah, so Svalbard is a territory of Norway, but it's kind of like a ish territory. And you might say, how is that possible? Does it belong to Norway? Yes, no. And the simple answer is, yeah, it belongs to Norway. However, despite that, and despite the only way to get to Svalbard 
practically speaking, for people, being via Norway. So it's within, you know, to get to Norway, uh, to get to Svalbard, you practically speaking have to be able to get into Schengen, which means it's practically a part of, you know, EU, the, or the Euro EEA, I guess I should say, not the Euro, so, uh, not the European Union, but it's practically speaking, you know, like owned by Norway and therefore a part of the EEA, part of that whole thing. But on a treaty level, it's not Svalbard because of the really complex nature of it being so far north that lots of countries tried to claim it and then never kind of did and tried to stop other countries claiming it. Uh, Svalbard became a Norwegian territory, but with the clear thing that any citizen can enter, officially speaking, uh, you know, there's no like visa system or whatever, and also that any country that has signed the treaty on Svalbard can do economic activity. So there's two countries in Norway performing economic activities. There's Norway, and do you want to guess what the second country is? It's Russia. So uh, Barentsburg is the most famous Russian uh, town. You can, they've got a statue of Lenin up. It's a, it's a really weird place, but you've got to bear in mind that Russia has multiple settlements on Svalbard, all producing a loss economically. You know, they're just there for economic purposes, but a lot of, uh, you know, Svalbard does belong to Russians. So Pyramiden is the wildest example to me because it's a Swedish town that Russia bought uh, from Sweden. Again, so Sweden, previously used to use their rights, now they don't. And uh, yeah, it, it's weird because this is a Norwegian territory this far north in the Arctic. It has, again, uh, if, if you want to really just see how close it is, it's one of the furthest north places you can physically get to on Earth. Uh, and despite being in Norway, but kind of not in Norway, you see right here, Pyramiden in nice Latin, or in Latin characters. I, I find them nice because I speak the language. Uh, but then you also see above it, uh, Pyramiden in the Cyrillic alphabet in Russian. And uh, yeah, it's wild. There's this part of Norway that's really more Russian than Norwegian. And this is one of the clever things for the future of like, guess what? The future of the Arctic, whether you like climate change or don't like climate change or don't believe in climate change even, uh, the North, the Arctic is magically or scientifically, one of the two. You, you don't have to agree with me on which one it is, but the Arctic is unfreezing. It is becoming more and more valuable. Canada is benefiting in terms of trade routes, and Russia is benefiting in terms of having more usable land, uh, more military bases and that, you know, places to reject power from, and also they're using it as a way to get more and more places, and Svalbard is a key part of that plan. That's right, Russia, uh, their next conflict, their next border dispute might be of Norway, and the thing about Russia is they tend to win these. The only uh, you know, it, Russia is a huge country which is a master of border manipulation. The whole reason that Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzstan have their mess of a situation right here, it's Russian involvement. Uh, the reason that there was a gray area that allowed them to claim Crimea or, you know, Georgia or any of the situations anywhere around Russia is because they, if there's anything that Russia is a master of, it is territorial anomalies and winning disputes that arise from them. And yeah, I, as someone who finds that interesting, again, I'm not, I'm not, this isn't meant to be a this is good, this is bad video. I wanted to make this video to let you know about the reality of the Russian future, and I hope you learn something from it. Russia is a wild power, and because the, the thing is, is most people when they talk about this sort of thing, they're like, ah, and this is why it's objectively uh, good and bad. You know, Russia bad, West good, or West bad, Russia good. It's like, no, Russia is acting in Russians' interests. Uh, you know, we act in our own interests, whatever country you live in over here in this br broad thing we call the West, but it's just how things work. So yeah, next time you think, why is Putin so popular? Although there is a lot of underhanded stuff. Um, I think they arrest the opposition leader a lot of the time, and uh, although there might be some vote stuffing or whatever, the majority of Russians are pro-Putin. Even when they do international studies, into, uh, you know, international opinion polling rather, uh, even though he doesn't have the necessarily the exact same lead as he got at the election, he is still the most popular presidential or prime ministerial, whichever position he's running for at the time, candidate in Russia at any given time. And that is because, economically speaking, Russia's doing very well. And that is because, in terms of, you know, the war side of things, which is the second key thing, they're also doing very well. One of the key things that led to Margaret Thatcher being re-elected in 81, actually, was the Falklands dispute. When you get a country against another country, you know, the, the internal divide into countries is always a big, fight, uh, big, big kind of thing where two countries are fighting, uh, sorry, Every country always has a two-party system where both parties fight and everyone's playing partisan as heck, but as soon as another country gets involved, everyone can collectively fight that other country. And when you have the economy on your side and you have, uh, you know, this whole partisan thing against other countries, it's easy to see why Russia has the grip on power that they do right now. And yeah, I'd love to talk about Russian geopolitics sometime in the future. I'd also would love to speak about um, Manchuria, uh, because one of the things I looked into for the research of this was Manchuria. So Manchuria is this right here. Um, 
Obviously, these are the countries that recognize Manchuria. And although, you know, you probably know something about it, it's like World War II, something, something, something. I learned just a few things that I really wanted to throw out there. One, Manchuria's governor was actually Shinzo Abe's, the, or Abe, uh, the prime minister of Japan right now. His grandfather was the, you know, the, the governor of the place, which is kind of wild if you ask me. And second of all, they have one of the ugliest flags I've ever seen. And I was thinking, because I made that video on the country that could have been, which was, um, <laughs> I forget the name of it, uh, but it's the one in Europe between Belgium, uh, Germany, and you know the, the one over here. I, I don't know why its name is escaping me right now, but that country that I totally know the name of and didn't forget on the spot, um, you know, that I, I was thinking of making videos on other, like, countries that formerly existed or, you know, did, could have existed, and I feel like they're flanked. Something about this is wild. Like, it's ugly as heck, but there is a purpose. It's like, this is Manchuria, and these are the, the peoples of it. Red is for Han Chinese, and blue is for Japanese, and it, oh, the Japanese people. It's, it's just wild stuff. I, I love historical flags and their significance. It's ugly today, but this was a real flag at some point. And yeah, let me know if you want to see that, I guess. Leave a comment and say you like former flags and former countries and former countries' flags. And finally, also, I just want to mention, because uh, I have, you know, in, in these videos, it's mostly focusing on geopolitics, geography, but if you're curious about Russia as a country to actually go to, uh, I actually have, uh, by coincidence, uh, been there. It was, like, maybe two years ago now, and I looked for a few of the images from it, just because, you know, let's let's do one of those slideshow things. First of all, uh, if you look at the... Um, it's just off screen. I didn't even realize. But uh, first of all, if you look right here, um, so we just zoom in really far, you can see how there is uh, on the Aeroflot logo. So this is the National Russian Airline. Their 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 logo is just a hammer and sickle flying, and it's they haven't updated it since the Soviet times. And something about that, like because I flew Aeroflot to Russia, very very strange thing. Just wanna point that out right now. Like they've got a flying hammer and sickle for an airline. Second of all, um, this is oh, so everything zoomed in right now. Uh, second of all, uh, this is the favorite thing I ate in Russia, which sounds ridiculous, but there's a, um, there's a, if you ever go to Russia, there is a fast food chain only in Russia. It's called Krushka Kwartoshka, I believe that is, like for something potato, microwave potato. Uh, they microwave potatoes. Again, it's not like a, I'm making fun of them. They microwave potatoes. That's their like selling point. We microwave potatoes. And it was like the tastiest way I've ever had potato. It tasted like noodles, but it was potato and they put cream in it. Again, it, this looks su like such a sad meal, but it was delicious and it cost me like some less than a hundred rubles, I want to say, which is very little what today's price is. Third of all, uh, underrated thing to do in Moscow, there's a Soviet arcade, like Soviet arcade machines copied uh, the ones from America and such, but in really weird, odd ways, and it makes them like a desire, as someone who likes arcades and all that sort of stuff, you know, I was just in Japan, as you can probably imagine, uh, I, I like arcades, and Soviet arcades are super quirky, maybe it's your thing, and, uh, oh, this, I, just, I didn't remember what this last one was, uh, one of the things this <laughs> that was the most surreal to me is, uh, even though you might think that Russia hates the West, Russia hates uh, everything that's not Russia, and oh, they're just out for Russian stuff. Uh, no, I, <laughs> one of the places that I just, I couldn't resist this since I saw it, was a Beverly Hills diner. Uh, it's super, super strange. It feels like America, but you're in Russia. Um, and yeah, they, they, they like Amer a lot of people in any country, like a lot of things. And, you know, in, in Russia, I don't think there is this huge hostility that you see in other countries. I think, in general, actually, there, you know, in the modern world, very few people wildly hate another people so far away. Like, you know, there's a lot of people in localized situations, like, oh, British people might hate French people, or Irish people might hate British people, or whatever it is. There's, like, this close sometimes hatred, but usually, like, jokingly. I mean, not so much in this situation, but we'll talk about that some other time. Um, but I think most people don't hate most people. If you think there's a country that hates you and hates your freedom and hates whatever else, uh, it's, it's not Russia, probably. It's not... It's not any of these countries, as far as I can tell. Um, and that's a good thing, I think, for the world. Or maybe it's not. Maybe you think it's a bad thing. Maybe we should hate each other more. Let me know what you think. But for now, uh, second channel. Uh, don't care, as far as I'm aware. Goodbye. <laughs> was there anything else I was forgetting? Nah. Discuss it on Reddit, I guess. Bye.